Tennis University. Please like our tense. It's General Physics 1. Today, Springs, featuring Simple Harmonic Motion. Dr. Stenson. Also, a special guest. And now, a man who wants you to know that he has not monetized his YouTube channel. The ads just show up because he uses this great copyrighted music. Professor Hafner. Oh, come on. Just gotta cut that out. All right, I'm so modest. All right, so we're in week nine of 13 weeks of lecture. And I don't, uh, yeah, so one announcement is students were asking me if your students are comfortable finding a group to study in. You know, normal semester, massive study groups, people doing the homework in the commons, yada, yada. So I want to make sure everybody can find something like that opportunity if they're looking for it. So that's why I put that message in the discussion. And thank you, Karen, for getting it started. And I think at least 10 people have responded. So now I need continued initiative for someone to suggest a time. Otherwise, I will suggest a time, which will be like, how about six in the morning? Right, so I think a college student said, throw out a few times and maybe y'all can come together and uh, and find a link or send out a link or find a time to meet safely on campus. So I encourage that to continue. I'll try to push it along if it doesn't continue so y'all can uh, sort of work together on problems and studying. Um, and keep in mind, all next week's review, we have another totally free review week. No homework, no new concepts. We'll just review for exam two, which is just gonna be momentum energy, and this little spring stuff we're about to talk about, uh, simple harmonic motion. So it doesn't cover too much. Well, okay, all of energy is, yeah. Uh, let's see, so today we, oh, well, attendance, how are we doing? 63%, we're hanging in there. Uh, after exam two, we might be in the 50s. Of course, we're running out of time. If we hold in the 60s the whole semester, that'll be um, interesting. Uh, today, I'm going to show you these, talk about them, and make Dr. Stenson a panelist. So yeah, today we're going to finish up talking about energy diagrams, which we just need a few more minutes to, to go over. And then um, we're going to talk about simple harmonic motion. So basically mass on a spring kind of stuff. We talked about springs already a little bit to be able to cover the other material. But we also need to talk about letting it move. We haven't let the springs, the masses on the springs move yet. So that's what we're going to describe today. And also pendulums uh, fall into this category of simple harmonic motion. All right, turn that off. And I think we're ready to go. All right. Energy diagrams. So we talked about it a bit last time. We said, remember, well, it's really nothing new. It's just showing you how physicists and even other people like to think about a system that's oscillating or moving. It's usually systems that are bound, you know, a mass bound to a spring, an electron bound to an atom. Uh, so if we had that mass on a spring, which is what we're talking about today, just in a different context, we could write the equations, F equals minus kx. We could talk about the potential energy, one half kx squared, the kinetic energy of the mass, one half mv squared. But we would often like to make a plot of the potential energy. So energy diagrams usually formally plot the potential energy. And if we say this is you know, the rest position of the spring, the natural length of the spring, then that's where it kind of has no potential energy. I mean, that's where you could define it to be zero. Technically, you could give it a potential value there. Um, and then if you were to plot the spring potential, it's 1 half kx squared. So it goes up whether you go this way or go that way. That's why it's different than gravitational potential. So here we go. Goes up like x squared. Goes up like x squared on the minus side. And just the idea is there's a lot of information here. If this is, you know, labeled in joules, and this is labeled in meters or something, 
then you can say, what is the potential of kinetic energy? Uh, or no, you can say, let's see. Um, the thing is st so stationary here at uh, 1.6 meters. How much potential energy does it have? Uh, you just go boop, 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 up, over, and you read it off the graph. The, the reason we like these is there's no math to do. You just look at the graph. You read things off the two axes. That's all there is to do, right? So there's not some new set of equations you deal with. That's like the point. So you'd say, what is the energy at 1.6 meters? Well, you need to know a little bit more than that. If it's stationary at 1.6 meters, this plot will tell you the, poten the spring potential. If it's 1.6 and moving, then it's also gonna have some kinetic. But you could be told, well, it's moving around, but the farthest it ever gets is 1.6 meters. That means when it gets there, it's not moving. Maybe that's where it's turning around. You might be told there's a turnaround point at x equals 1.6 meters. So if there's a turnaround point, the velocity goes to zero, so the kinetic energy goes to zero. That's usually gonna be the case because you can't read the kinetic energy off this anywhere. The details of the problem have to tell you the kinetic energy. So you would go 1.6, oh, blah, 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 boop, like three joules, something like that. And you could read off that there's three joules. Then a problem could say, if you released it from there, how fast is it going when it gets here? Well, when it gets here, what's the potential of spring energy? Zero. So all three joules must have been converted to kinetic. So three joules equals one FMV squared. Or you could be told, actually, it goes halfway. How much kinetic does it have when it's halfway back? Well, you just read off the graph and you say, okay, it's lost two joules. So two joules equals one FMV squared. So the point of this is supposed to be read numbers off the graph and then use them to solve problems. <clears throat> there may be equations involved where, you know, once you have this value, then you use an equation. But fundamentally, the point of an energy diagram is to read it off the graph. And then we can generalize <clears throat> um, the energy. No, no, let's, let's do this first. Another thing is we can go between the force the diagram, diagram. Can't remember if I did this last time or not, but I'll just give you the answer because the calculus is just symbolic to show it to you. There's really no reason uh, to show it to you. Actually, I think we did it last time. Is that the relationship is that the force uh, a mass feels, it could be anything, really, it could be a mass, but we're doing intro physics mechanics, so it's gonna be a mass. The force the mass feels is minus the derivative of the energy with uh, space. And here we're talking about the potential energy diagram, okay? And you can kind of see that makes sense here. For the spring, the farther out you go, the bigger the negative force back, right? F equals minus kx. As x gets bigger, the force pushes back harder. And here you can see the farther out you go, the bigger the slope, the bigger the du dx, and it pushes back. All right, so here the slope's really high, big negative du dx pushing back. And if you come here, now remember that is, that's positive du dx, that's a positive value of slope, right? Increasing in both axes. Here, the slope is a negative value. If you calculated the numerical slope of that, you get a negative value that gets bigger as you go farther away. If you put a negative value in the slope, negative, negative, positive, and sure enough, the force will push you that way. Right, so that formula tells you the force pushes like that if you're here, the force pushes like that if you're there. Today, as we get into oscillators, there's gonna be a lot of equations, okay? So I'm gonna start putting double boxes around sort of the importance. Today is very equation-y and we'll do more problems about the stuff we're talking about today and Thursday and all next week. All right. Okay, so let's see. The mass feels that, and this is, yeah, the negative derivative of the potential. Negative derivative potential. And we can even do problems like that. You know, if the potential doesn't have to have this shape of like x squared, like a parabola, we could just draw any potential. That's the point, is you can use this for any system. So if we drew this with like a V with lines, whoops, you could get negative dx off the graph because you know how to get this slope because you took 
algebra or whatever. So you know, you know that it's rise over run. You can measure, okay, it went over a meter, went up 10 joules, the slope of that, 10 joules per meter. So you could actually calculate the forces from that. So that's sort of an important conceptual thing and something you can use uh, quantitatively. Okay, so that's kind of how you use energy, energy diagrams. Let me show you something else, how we, the reason that we like these so much. Can you differentiate between the Kx minus Kx? Yeah, so the, for, oh, the force is minus Kx, the potential energy of the spring is not minus, it's one half Kx squared. You got like 3D board happening here. Right, so this is Hooke's law, F equals minus Kx. You move this way, it pulls that way, move this way, it pulls that way. Spring potential energy, one half Kx squared is the potential energy, the work you do to get there. And that's positive on both sides. Right, yeah, so they look similar, you don't want to mix them up. They'll be on the equation sheet, you know, that'll help. Yeah. Let's see, Hooke's law, we just told you, we didn't prove it. The spring potential energy we derived by the amount of work you do when you push on the end of a spring. So one we just told you, one we derived. Um, you can also think about an energy landscape. So um, Jose Anuchik in my department uh, did a big thing. He's well known for looking at protein folding and thinking about the energy landscape of protein folding. And as the proteins fall into little minima that we're about to draw, and then they're working their way to the main the lowest energy, which is how the protein folds. This is a thermodynamic naive physics view of how proteins fold. They don't really, it's really more complicated than that, but that's part of what he did, is bring in the complicated stuff. And instead of saying the protein ends up there, let's think of it as a landscape of potentials, that the protein has different mechanisms to move through and study that. that he's a theory guy, that's what he did. So for example, an energy landscape, I'll look like this. And you say, I don't know the formula for that. Neither do we, right? That's the point of the energy uh, diagram is you don't have to know all the details. You can just look at it and learn things. So, you know, if you have something at A here, I'm really losing my audio. Hopefully I'm lined up. Okay, so you have something at A. Um, it has no kinetic energy. It's not going anywhere. If you give it some kinetic energy, all right, and say push it up to here at B and let it go. And here it's at rest. You release it from rest. Then the total energy it has is that value. So it's never going to have that much unless you put some energy into it. So if you release it from here, it'll roll down here and go up to here, back and forth, little oscillator that we're about to talk about. That's as far as you can get. If you were to put it up to here, and let it go. Technically, that's a stable point, but the slightest little perturbation might push it that way or that way. So if you're asked, how much energy do you need to get from A to C? And the answer is you're gonna have to give it this much. Right? You're gonna have to at least give it enough to get over this hump, and then it can fall down to C. All right? How do I get that number? It's an energy diagram. You read it right off the y-axis. The point of energy diagrams is supposed to be that it makes it easy, not that it makes it hard. We can put something at A, something at B, something at C, something at D, and say which of these positions will allow the mass to explore the entire energy landscape. You look and say which one is D. If you released it from D, it has no kinetic, it has a lot of potential. It gets down to here, it's going really fast. Will it make it up to here? Yes, because the difference between here and here, it has less potential energy here than here. So it must have kinetic. So it just keeps on going down to here, up to here. That's all these things are. Um, that's, and then you have problems just like that in your homework. Um, here to here, how much kinetic does it have? Uh, measure that off the thing. There's your kinetic. Or how fast? 1 FMV squared. Physicists use this to figure out like things like why do bonds exist? I mean, not to figure out why, but to visualize it and think about it. You know, if we have sort of like A is the atom, and uh, you know, A is atom, we got one atom, 
and you got another atom on an x-axis, and that one is fixed. And this one can move. You could make like an energy diagram for what does it look like when V moves? What's the potential energy of the system? Now this is getting beyond our just little mechanical types of energy, so I'm not going to put a subscript. It's not spring and it's not gravitational. But let's look at it. Let's see. So there are, uh oh, yeah. What is the graph in, what on the graph is the stable equilibrium? Yeah, so there's this would be stable and this would be stable. Anywhere where the potential is flat, basically, and it's always going to come back. This is unstable equilibrium. Potential's flat, but the potential put the force pushes it away. So wherever it'll push you back to a place like that. Or just think of it as a surface, and if you put a marble in it and came back in an hour, would the marble, any chance it would be there? If the answer is yes, it's stable equilibrium. Um, getting back to this, then what interactions are there between these two atoms? So one is uh, the Pauli exclusion principle. They can't occupy the same space at the same time. The electrons can't occupy the same states at the same time. So that says you're happy to be far away. Everything's fine there, but oh my God, we well, can't get too close. So there's a strong repulsion. There's also an attraction in chemistry. What do they want to do? They want to complete their closed shells, right? They want to bond. So again, these are not really interactions that we would draw like this, but you get the idea. So you've got one thing repelling very strong, one thing attracting over a longer range. If you add these, then you get something that looks kind of like this. So when you add a bunch of interactions, maybe you end up with a point of stable equilibrium. And that's where a bond is. So if you want the bond length, you can actually measure it. There's the bond length, center to center, when the thing sits there. So theorists calculate these interactions, add them together, look at it, and say, does it look like a bond? And if it does, then they say, good. We know what we're doing. We are contributing. And the best is if you calculate something that no one can measure, then you can freaking do whatever you want, right? <laughs> Make any claim you like, so nobody can measure it. So that's really all I was gonna say about energy diagrams. Mm -hmm. Let's see, little product placement there. Um, okay, I'm going to erase this. And we're going to move on to, to oscillators. Oscillators. Maybe the most fundamental concept in all of grown-up physics. Maybe. Oscillations, let's just define that. It's just touched on in intro physics. But if you go a step a toe outside of intro physics, oscillators for years. But you just care, well, oscillator is the thing that's oscillating. So that's what we like to talk about. But let's go a little simpler to talk about what the oscillation is in the first place. What is the oscillator doing that's so fundamental? It's going through repetitive back and forth motion. All right, so lots of things do that. One thing that does that is the venerable mass on a spring. Right, so we've drawn this before. We'll draw it again. There it is, that's the wall. That's the spring, and that's the mass, and there's no friction. So when we talked about Hooke's Law, we said the spring makes a force based on some constant of the spring called spring constant. Very cool name for that. And this thing, it's wise to put the position of the mass, the front, the back, the center doesn't matter, treating it as a point particle, 
where the spring force is zero when the position is zero, the natural length of the spring. So we'll almost always do that in this class because we're not trying to do mathematically complicated, unnecessarily complicated things. And we know that if we pull the mass this way, it feels a spring force back. And if we push the mass that way, it feels a spring force back. It's a restoring force. Right, so restoring force. So we kind of talked about this earlier because it shows up in so many problems, because we used to do this earlier. Uh, so we told you the equation is that F is minus kx. And if you want, you can do it in vector notation. Where in this case, x really should be delta x. It should be the displacement of the spring. But we're saying it's always displacing from 0 right there. So we just say x. x just means a vector from 0 to the point you're displacing to. So here, there's x. Here, there's x. Like that. And then you can see k is just the multiplier for x to get you newtons. And the negative is till it tells you that the x and the f push in different directions. It always pushes back because it is a restoring force. It restores the original uh, position. That's all fine and dandy. Here, let me put a double box on that bad boy right there because even though you already know it, you're going to need that. But now we could ask the question, how does it move? How's it going to move? How do we figure out how it's going to move? Let's use one of Newton's three laws. Hmm, which one should we use? Can't think of any. How about the second? That's the one that tells you how something moves. The sum of the forces is the mass times the acceleration. Um, and let's see. Oh, let's think about the system. Ooh, what are we? Let's see. The system is just the mass here. The spring is an external force. And we're in 1D, so let's dispense with the uh, vector notation, and we'll just use minus signs to indicate directions. All right, so minus kx equals m times, what is a really? It's the second derivative of the position. So I'm going to go ahead and write that as a second derivative, which I don't know if I formally told you this notation or not, dt2. That just means second derivative. If you have the position as a function of time, you take one derivative to get the velocity, you take another derivative to get the acceleration. Okay. So you might see it written as x double dot. Right? The double dot means two derivatives with respect to the independent variable, which in this case is time. Everything's versus time when you're doing motion. All right, so how do we solve that? Uh, well, how did we solve it before? Okay, I don't know. How do we solve it before? Well, when we were doing uh, 2D trajectories and 1D motion, uh, we, I don't know if we told you, but we were just integrating it. Right, we had this integral of delta V, so we took the, well, you remember, we took the integral and, you know, position and V times T and 1 half AT squared. Right, 1 half AT squared comes from taking an integral of something times T. Integral of AT is 1 half AT squared. So we just integrated, is what I'm trying to say. So, can we solve this by integration? All right, let's at least get to V. We have A, let's get to V. Okay, integrate once. Integral of that with respect to time is V, or dx dt. Cool, we can integrate the right. If we do it again, we'll be to x. Let's integrate the left. What's the integral at? 1 half kx squared. No, we've integrated with respect to the wrong thing. We're integrating with respect to time. We need the integral of minus kx dt, but okay, minus kxt, no, <laughs> because k is constant, but x is not a constant. What is x? x is a function of time. So we got to integrate that function of time, but we don't know what it is. We're trying to find it. So I guess we're just over. We're done. All right, I'll see you guys on Tuesday. So the question is, how do you, what do you do in this case? How do you, how do you solve this most simple fundamental differential equation um, in all of physics? Uh, and you're not going to believe this, but the answer is you guess the answer. There's no way to just get it. You just have to guess. 
Okay, so mathematicians don't like to admit that this is what they're doing. Okay, so they have words like we're going to construct a solution, all these fancy things they say. They're just guessing. I think what's, oh yeah, the physicists will say we're going to start with an onsorts. We'll start with the following onsorts. Okay, so onsorts is German for guess. It's just, you know, the German physicists came up with it. Or they would say it and everybody else would be like, oh, well, let's say that. Okay, let's not do any more history. <laughs> okay. uh, let's see, so we're going to guess. So we're going to look at this and say, I mean, we could, let's rearrange it a little. Uh, d2x dt2 equals minus k over mx, where x is a function of time. So how are we going to get, how are we going to guess? So the only thing we know to guess is we know that we're looking for a function. If you multiply it by some constants, including a negative sign if needed, you get back to the original function. So what function is equal to its own second derivative, its own second derivative, to within a constant? What I used to do is bring down five students and make them race. And when one of them got one right, they got to sit down. So I can't bring down five students, but I can go to the chat. I am not going to talk anymore and cover what's on the exam. <laughs> That's not a good threat, okay? I'm not going to say anything more useful to you about what's on the exam until five, we get five answers in the chat. A function equal to its own second derivative to within a constant, x of t, anyone, so e to the x, cosine, sine, we got throw okay. I was going to read names, it came, let's see who had the fastest finger here. Thomas Hamra said e to the x, Sania Elik said cosine, and Jack Bodnar, Bodnar said sign. Very good. You guys got three of them. And then many other people immediately got e to the x. I said there's five, so let's keep thinking. Sine is one, cosine is one, e to the x is one. And two more, two more, zero. Thank you, Karina, for getting zero. One more. Oh, Ooh, Lon. Yeah, Lon. I don't think about it. I don't think Lon is one. One more. All right, I'm through. There isn't another one. I just always do that, you know, because Rice undergrads are so smart. I think, you know, maybe they'll think of one. <laughs> maybe they'll think of a fifth one. There is no fifth one. I mean, in terms of the basic math, there's no fifth one. These are the ones. So these are functions you could plug in there. Derivative of sine is cosine. Derivative of cosine, negative sine. Derivative of cosine, negative sine. Derivative of sine, negative cosine. E to the x, e to the x, e to the x. Technically, we have a negative sign problem here. Imaginary numbers, let's not get into it. Zero, derivative zero, zero, derivative zero, zero. Negative zero, equal zero. So all four of those are good guesses. Excellent work. Let's see, is there any physical reality to this? Here is my mass on a spring. Mm, static. The fact that mine is up and down, don't worry. Just the, you can pretend this, the average weight here extends the natural length. So it's basically the same math. So when I say how does it move, let's make it move. Ah, does that motion look like sine? Yeah, if you know a little bit about sine. If you don't, you're about to. Does it look like cosine? It also looks like cosine. Yeah. Does it look like e to the x? No. But we do have this negative sign problem. If we fix that negative sign problem, uh, it will look like e to the x. But yeah, it takes off more physics to hear about that, more complex analysis. Does it look like zero? One case does. This. Zero is what we call the trivial solution. It's the solution to what does it look like when it moves? You can say, well, it could also not move. Right? So that's also a solution. So three of those obviously work. One of those works if you take a lot more math. So we're going to look at the more basic ones, the sine and the cosine, because those are the, the good ones. Zero is the Eddie Haskell answer. There's a guaranteed reference, not even Dr. Stenson. Would. I think I know more than Dr. Stenson. Pretty I sure. know who Eddie Haskell is. He knows who Eddie Haskell is, okay. <laughs> we had this debate about who's older. I forgot who won, or who lost. Okay, so let's guess. Let's go ahead and guess sign, but now you can't just say sign, we're done, going home. You gotta make it a real solution that like fits with a problem. But make it a real solution. 
the illusion. All right, so you know what sine looks like. And, or if you don't, it's actually very helpful in this class and future classes to have a good intuition for what sine and cosine look like. It's not much, they have the same shape, just what do they do at zero? If you know that, that'll get you pretty far in life. Okay, so if we were gonna plot these solutions, they're solutions for the position. Here's zero position. We're doing a kinematics plot versus time. All right. So sine, what does it look like? Well, that looks like this. And it keeps going, it doesn't stop. So the properties of sine we care about are the amplitude. How high does it get in A, and how does it high to get negative A? Or how far down does it go negative A? You know, sine, the pure sine function, only goes from one to minus one. But if we're gonna use it in physics, we probably wanna put a prefactor in front of it so it can describe any amplitude we want. Ah, good idea, thank you. And this comes back down. And then there's the period of the sine. You might think of that as the wavelength, but that's because you're used to putting X or the position here. When you put time here, a full cycle in time is big T period in seconds. So A is amplitude and uh, T, big T is the period. And there's also uh, something called phase, phi. People lose their stuff over phase, okay? We are gonna talk about phase a lot next semester. I'm gonna define the reason people are confused about phase is because there's three kinds of phase. I'm not gonna get into that now, it's not necessary. For now, just know that there's a phase. The phase is like where it sits, where does it go? We'll calculate phase in a little bit, don't worry. Okay. Phase is where it starts, basically. Because really, a, a pure sine function is always zero is zero, but your motion doesn't have to be zero is zero. So you could adjust the phase to have it go back and forth. So if you do that, you would write your solution like this. A sine, technically you would have to put two pi over the period times the independent variable t, right? We'll change that to something else in a minute, plus phi, okay? So this part makes sense, that's the amplitude, right in front of the sine, we're cool with that. This is basically the frequency, and why do we write it two pi over big T times little t. Well, one reason is uh, anything inside a sine or a cosine in physics, in the real world, uh, has to be in radians, basically. So this is saying two pi, how many radians per second, and then at what point in time are we? And that tells us how many radians we've gone through. And that's why phi also is in radians. Right, let me check the time, because we're gonna go on. Okay, this is like a three hour lecture. Okay, cool. Oh, we're screwed, okay. Okay, so another way we write 2 pi over t, 2 pi over the period then is the number of radians per second or something we refer to as omega. The angular velocity, the circular velocity, we've used it in other ways in circular motion. We didn't get too into it with circular motion. We will with rotational motion, but it's any time you have something going around a circle or going through a cycle, it's how many radians of that cycle uh, per second. Radians usually think of as maybe going around a circle. One trip around the circle is two pi. Also, one trip through the cycle is two pi. So it's a very similar, I mean, it's the same thing really, two pi over t. So that's one double box that you need to remember how to get omega, okay? So to put all that together, our next double box is, let's go ahead and just write it in terms of omega, because that's the more normal thing to do. Sine omega t plus that phi. Right, so that's the general uh, solution to how you would describe this oscillating motion for the mass on the spring. Okay. Um, we guessed that. How do we really know uh, that's uh, correct? So let's, we're going to look at that next. We can get through that before the break. Let's see, uh, so much. 
much motion. Okay. Okay. So that was our guess, and we say no. Is that right? right? And can we learn anything from that guess? And what is a omega and phi? How do I get those? Uh, so the next thing you do after you guess is you plug it in to check it. Okay. This is getting into like math that you're not really going to do. I'm just kind of trying to prove a few things to you. So in a few minutes, showing you where these things come from. Okay. So remember, it was minus k over m x equals d two x d t two. That second derivative. This was just Newton's law. Newton's second law. Right. So the forces minus k x equals m a. But now we take this guessed solution. This. Uh, Constructed, fabricated, what's the word they say? We, I forgot. Uh, and we say minus, it's gonna hit me in a second. Minus camera, now x, our guess, a sine omega t plus phi. That's one side of the equation. The other side, constructive solution. Or we are, this is our constructed solution. Two derivatives of our constructed solution. Take the derivative of the sine, you get cosine. You got to multiply by the derivative of this thing in parentheses. With respect to time, the derivative of that thing in parentheses is omega plus zero, right? Constant. No time there, so that doesn't contribute. So it's a omega cosine omega t plus five. But we need another derivative. So then that cosine becomes negative sine, pull out another omega. So it becomes minus, because of that second derivative, a omega squared sine omega t plus phi. Right. And then uh, we look at that and say, basically we're talking to the equations. We're saying, does this work? We're asking the S equation, is this okay? And then the equation response is, is yeah, if this is true, okay, is this true? Let's cancel some stuff. I like to cancel things. Did you guys like to cancel things? K over M is omega squared. So it's true if this is true. Uh, solution correct if this is true. And what that means is which one of these is like an unknown? Well, you know the spring constant, you can measure it. You know the mass, you can measure it. You're assigned to that. But you don't know how fast it's going to move. You don't know what the frequency is going to be. This is telling you the frequency is the square root of k over m. Okay? So that's for a mass on a spring. That is the, for example, is the natural frequency. Okay, natural frequency of mass on a spring. Square root of k over m. So it does depend on the mass and it does depend on the stiffness of the spring. And you can see, like, we could measure this one's spring constant and we could measure its mass and we could calculate square root of k over m. Let's see, what else could we do with this? Um, now, what about uh, here's our solution here a, omega, and phi. There were actually three things that we needed to find. So plugging it in told us omega, but it just canceled a and it just canceled phi. And what that's telling you is that a and phi can take any value. Oh, okay, not any value, not infinity, but they, they depend on initial conditions. And to get into uh, deeply into all that, and then we're getting into sophomore physics. Okay, so we're only gonna go so far. First, I'm gonna show you a demo though. Here we go. This is the simple harmonic motion demo. Is that they take any value you want. So let's see if this is true. So let's go back to our mass on our spring and now see if we displace from the point of stable equilibrium, what happens? And sure enough, it moves like a sinusoid. It is a simple harmonic oscillator. So this part is correct, it does move like this. Let's see if omega naught is really set by the properties of the system. So it's saying that it'll always oscillate at the same frequency, square root of k over m. So let's see, let's just watch a few. So that's sort of the frequency, you can get that in your head. 
And now I will give it a bigger amplitude. So you can kind of see it's about the same frequency. And now I'll give it a smaller amplitude. And now I'll give it a really small amplitude. So you can see, I don't have a lot of rhythm, I'm doing my best. But you can see that the omega naught, the natural frequency, really is roughly constant, no matter what conditions we give it. Now let's see, a and phi take any value. Can the amplitude take any value? Yes, it can have a big amplitude, or it can have a small amplitude, as we just showed. And it's still gonna follow a sinusoid. Finally, can phi, can the phase of, can the phase lag take any value? And the answer is yes, because I can make any time I want zero. In this uh, demonstration, I am God. I can say zero is now, or zero is now, or zero is now. Right? So indeed, the amplitude and the phase are free to take any value, and omega naught is set by the properties of the system. That was a demonstration uh, that this is true, that omega is set, the other two can vary. Before we do the break, I wanna tell you real quick about phase and how you find the phase. And it's related to this question of, what if we had to pick cosine? Should you pick sine? Should you pick cosine? It basically doesn't matter. It, it's up to you which one you pick. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna solve a problem uh, both ways and show you that in the end, they're physically the same. So what we're gonna say is we're gonna displace a mass spring and release at time equals zero, okay? So that's an overly abbreviated problem. <laughs> so what I mean is, you know, we pull it away from the origin and we release it. And then we ask ourselves what it's gonna do. Well, by now you know what it's gonna do, but let's just look at it here. So here it's in its rest position. And if I pull it down and release it, what's it gonna do? Or if you wanna think of up as positive, let's say I displace it up and release it, it's gonna oscillate. Okay? But we wanna think what's the difference if I describe that mathematically differently, how do we deal with that? Okay, so here's what we do, is we use these initial conditions. Okay, that's how you find. We know what omega is. It's a square root of k over m, okay? But how do we find, uh, and we kind of intuitively, you know what a is, the amplitude, that's how far I displaced it. It's just gonna oscillate between those two. So we're not gonna give you an example of calculating a. But what about this phi? That's the tricky one. Okay, so here we go. So you apply initial conditions. So what is the initial condition? The initial condition is that uh, you gave it a displacement at time equals zero. So you say um, x at t equals zero. Okay, this is not multiplying by this equation. I'm just letting you know. I could write x of zero, but you might forget it's a function of time. So fully explicit, x at time equals zero equals what? A, I displace it up to A. That is the initial condition. That also means if we plug in zero here, it should be equal to this. So it should be equal to a sine zero plus phi, if we use this sine notation. What if we go over here? We'd say a, that's the initial condition, equals a cosine zero plus phi. Now when you're asking how could these both be right, the answer is the phase will be different. That's what we're doing, is we're showing you what is the phase for these two cases. So you say, okay, we're solving for this phase, cancel the a's, that's just zero. So this is what's on the left side, work on your algebra, oh, one, okay, one. If you cancel everything, you just got one left. One equals sine of the phase. Here, uh, one equals cosine of the phase. So to get them, you just say, well, take the inverse sine of both sides. Where is sine of phi one, pi over two? So you get that phi for this answer is pi over two. Yes, it could be negative pi over two or three pi over two, whatever. There's multiple ones, but for now, we're just picking the small one close to zero, and it's positive. 
Where is cosine one? Zero. Okay. So there, we just solve for the phase. Sometimes it gets more complicated and you also have to use the velocity condition. I don't think we gave you any of those, but you could also say we released it from rest. You could take a derivative of this to get the velocity as a function of time and set that equal to zero at time zero. That's another boundary condition you have. Here, I think that's what would give you the amplitude. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we found two phases. Now, do they make physical sense? Um, if you will permit me, I'm going to erase this text and draw right here, the sinusoid, and say, let's see. Let's do this one first, because it had no phase. It's a cosine where this is zero. It's just A cosine omega t. You know what that looks like. Does that look like the motion? You bet your bibia it does. Oh, that's, yeah. Um, I need to look that one up. Okay, so yes, we displace it up. We released it from rest. What's the slope of the curve there? Zero, and it did that. What if we had a guess sign? So unfortunate, because it doesn't look like a sign, does it? Sign starts zero at zero. Well, that's what the phase lag is for. So when you add phase, you actually shift the curve to the left. A sign looks like this, but we've got to shift it to the left by pi over two. There's your phase shift, and that will make your sign do that. Right? That brings it to the positive down there. It's not as nicely drawn as that one. So you see, there's the answer. You can pick sine or cosine. You'll get different phase constants. Physically, they're the same thing. It's just mathematically how do you describe it. So if you go into physics more, it's, it saves you time. It's wise to pick the right sine or cosine that works with the problem. Like if I was doing this problem, I would pick cosine. And then I don't have to deal with the phase, it'll be zero. Well, I actually did the whole thing with complex exponentials, but you'll see. When you all convert to physics majors, you'll find out. Okay, so now we're going to take the break. And then we're going to talk about, so this has been a lot of undouble boxed formulas, okay? A lot of telling you why this stuff is the way it is. But next we're going to talk about how you would use this to calculate things like forces and energy and momentum and all that. And there'll be lots of double boxed formulas there. So we'll talk a little about energy and then pendulums will be good shape. Okay, break time. It is, according to NIST, it is 10.27. Here we go, today's special visitor.
All right, we're back. I can hear. Good. Nice. Well, let's see. I just saw a couple questions. I'm sure Dr. Jensen's answering most of them. Um, the big picture question was, uh, yes, I'm just showing you this so you'll know where it comes from. I could just say, oh, oscillator, A, sine omega, T plus phi. Everybody be like, what's phi? Where did that come from? Why is omega this great over him? But even that, our, we try to, we're assigning problems where you need to know it a little deeper than that. Because some things we just, I can't give you a formula for the phase. Phase depends on exactly the problem, how you set it up. There's no way I can just give you a formula that this will always work for phase. There's just no way. So that's why I'd like to give it to you a little deep. You will not be guessing exotic solutions and plugging them in and solving for unique frequency formulae. I don't think so. Yeah, you won't be doing that. That's why I was really just trying to box the main, the main ones. But so there's your big picture. Let's see. Where now? Speaking of big pictures, my notes are here. Here we go. So what we're gonna do now. And then let's see. Was the frequency to property and that one? Yes. That's a good one. So it's this concept of angular frequency or angular speed, all these omegas, they are defined to be radians per second. So like uh, frequency F is one over big T. That's what we're used to thinking of in Hertz. Right? That's the number of cycles per second. But when you take the sign of something, uh, you have to have radians in here. It has to be in terms of radians describe cycles, where a cycle is a full two pi. So if you put uh, one over big T times T, that's the number of cycles. But sine doesn't take number of cycles. It takes number of cycles times two pi, which is radians, right? So that's why you got to have two pi, or you can think of it as this is a number of cycles, and it's sort of two pi radians per cycle. You gotta multiply it by two pi radians per cycle to get to get it in cycles. Yeah, that's just math, right? Or you can just think of it. This is why my math teacher always put a two pi. Right? But it's just the it's just the natural the way the universe works. Yeah. But that's the fundamental difference. F is in hertz. Omega is the angular version or the rotational or circular version that has to be in 2 pi. It has to be in radians. Okay. Uh, okay. Anywho. Um, okay. So here's the next thing to say about a mass on a spring is if you have the position is a function of time, you have everything. And by have, I mean if you have written an expression for it, then you can get anything you want. So let's say you wrote one and you went with sine, omega t plus phi, some problem where you were given some of these, you sold for the other ones, and now you have the whole thing. Or you're doing it symbolically and you just say, this is the answer. Right? So one, if you want v, take a derivative. If you want v, v, sine to cosine, pull out an omega, a omega cosine omega t plus phi. Now you have the velocities at all times. Take a derivative and you'll get the acceleration at all times. Pull out another omega, cosine becomes negative sine omega squared uh, sine omega t plus phi. And here's an illustration of why we're showing you in detail. These are all true if you chose sine. If you decide to describe a problem with cosine, then cosine becomes negative sine and then negative cosine again. So, but anyway, I'm showing it to you if you were to choose sine. Um, let's see, another thing we could say, what if you want the sum of the forces for all time? Well, you have the acceleration. Now, if it goes ma, in this case, all the forces, where we just have a spring force, there's really nothing else pushing on it, just multiply this by m. Right? So the force on it is minus m um, a omega squared sine omega t jump plus phi. So you have the force at all time. 
What if you wanted to find the kinetic energy? Okay, we know the formula. One half m v squared. Can I square that? You can. I know you can. Let's do it. One half m square it. A squared omega squared. Sine, can I square sine? Yes. Omega t plus phi. Sorry about that. Okay. Squared the whole thing. We're out of control. What about potential energy? I mean, there's nothing stopping us at this point. What is the potential energy when you displace some to some distance x from the origin? which you set up correctly, where here the origin is the unstressed uh, string, one half kx squared. Oh, it was one half k x squared. So you say a squared sine squared. The kinetic energy is uh, cosine squared, just, just to confirm oh, people. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah, that's yeah. cosine, yeah. Thank you. All right. Let's see, so potential, so yeah, I want to cosine, sine squared, one of yeah. So here, even more information here. Sometimes you want these for all time, which you have here, but often you're asked, what's the maximum? And in every one of these, the maximum is the thing in front. The maximum position, A. What's the maximum velocity? A omega. Right? This is just going one to one, one plus one. Maximum acceleration, they're not going to ask you that. What's the maximum force? Yeah, you could say that. What about the negative sign? Well, you, if you want the maximum, it's like a magnitude. You ignore the negative sign. We know, we know it's negative m a omega squared uh, when the sign is 1. The sign will also go to negative 1. It'll be positive. The value will be positive in a omega squared. So these negative signs don't matter when you're talking about the maximum. What about the maximum kinetic energy? One half m a squared omega squared. What about the maximum potential energy? One half k a squared. Does that make sense? Yes. Because a is the farthest we ever push it. So that's when the spring is completely compressed or extended. One half k x squared there. And one half k a squared. But this is telling you more. It's telling you how it changes in time. So I'm going to put a double box over this whole board. Right, because these are really the equations you'll use to solve a lot of the problems, okay? And don't they make so much more sense since we did all the other crap? I hope so, otherwise I wasted like 40 minutes of our lives. You know, how much Netflix have you watched? I mean, should we really be concerned about that? Yes, most people caught my cosine, that's good. You're paying, you're watching me closely. You're not watching Netflix right now, so that's good. <clears throat> Unless me and Dr. Stinson get picked up by Netflix, and then you can do both. You know, I think with these ratings, it's just a matter of time. Finally, I catch my big Let's break. See. Do what? I'll finally catch my big break. Oh, our big break. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It is due. They're going to say, how do those rice, why are they so happy? It, what is it? And they're eventually going to figure out that it's 125, 126. So what we're going to do now is get a little bit more intuition for those energies, right? Because we use energy so much. I can't read my second word here. Flows. Oh, yeah, my flow. Energy flow in an oscillator between from kinetic to the potential energy in the spring. And you can probably kind of see that. Um, do people prefer sine or cosine? That's a good question. We have to do a survey. You guys don't do enough surveys, so we'll, we'll survey that. But really, the, the serious answer is, if you're being wise, you pick the one that makes the problem easier. And the, only way, the only way you know that is sort of experience. <laughs> so people just probably go 50-50 when they're just learning. Um, so yeah, the energy flows between kinetic and potential. So you can see, if you can imagine, when it's in the middle of moving fast, it is all kinetic, and uh, the spring for just that one instant isn't actually changed from its natural length, right? 
But at the end points of the motion, the turnaround points, it technically stops moving for a second. Kinetic is zero, and that's where the spring compression is maximum. So let's just make sure that uh, that happens physically, or that, that, that mathematically, that's what we get. So we just, just I'll be real fast, mass on a spring, natural position. When it goes here and when it goes here, let's compare these two, and when it's here. Right? So here, it's moving back and forth with V. Here, V equals zero. Here, V equals zero. Right? Moving back and forth in the two endpoints. So we just kind of convinced ourselves that here it's all kinetic, u equals zero. Here it's all potential, and here it's all potential. One half k x squared, it doesn't matter if it's negative or positive, it's x squared, and it's not moving. Okay. So we thought that through. Now let's look at the equations. Let's plot uh, those two functions for the energy time. Here we're going to write just E, because one plot's going to be kinetic, one is going to be uh, potential. The kinetic was the cosine squared, as I was corrected. What does cosine squared look like? If you plot it, it looks like cosine, but it doesn't go negative. It goes positive, and actually the frequency is twice as much, because rather than going down, it just goes back up and repeats. Right? So here is Cosine squared, this is the kinetic part right here. What did the uh, potential energy look like? Sine squared, same frequency, starts at zero. It's gonna do that. Okay. Oh, whoa, oh, sorry. Uh, I don't know if you can, actually small dots don't show up on the screen too well, so let me just, I'll draw it kind of light. I noticed when I make my children watch these videos. There you go. So the second little set of humps is the potential. So if you were to plot those two, you know, professionally, you would find that one is max and the other is min, because it's sine and cosine. And if you square it, that's going to be true. One is max and there's minimum. Also, you can think about what is even mechanical? It's k plus u. And doesn't it have to be constant if this is an isolated system? And it is. There's the E mechanical right there. It's the sum of these two. Here, here, if you go in between, it's half, and it just stays constant the whole time. All right, so those functions make plots that actually make sense with the conservation of energy. Do we want to do it with equations? Let's not do it with equations. Let me just show you the sneaky insight. Oh, there's a teeny bit of, it's not really useful. I probably could have done it faster than flipping the board back over. Oh, look at this for a second. If we were to add k and u, we've got a sine squared term and a cosine squared term, don't we? Sine squared plus cosine squared, hmm, that's equal to one, right? But then these prefactors on them, problem, problematic. Could we pull the prefactors out? No, because one is that one half ka squared. One half is one, the other one is one half ma squared omega squared. Uh, watch this. What is omega squared? K over m. Oh my god, they have the same prefactor! Oh my god. One half ka squared cosine squared plus one half ka squared sine squared. Pull up this one half ka squared cosine squared plus x squared is one. It's just constant. The energy is 1 half ka squared. Oh my god. So this E mech is 1 half ka squared. Now you might say, well, why did the potential looking one give us the total energy? Couldn't it be in terms of the maximum speed? It says, yes, it could. It's just the way we set up the problem, we drove ourselves towards using A. I could have a problem that didn't say you set it at A and release it. You kick it, you give it an initial V naught. You draw the whole thing in terms of V naughts, and you'd have found the total mechanical energy is one half M V naught squared, right? which is the same. Right? So, so anyway, I just want you to see those sine squareds and cosine squareds come together in a special way to give you a plot that conserves energy. All right. And that's the kind of problems you'll do. Uh, things like, you know, well, you'll find out. 
Uh, there's not only about 10 of them, so. And we'll come up with more examples next week for the review. Or it took him as perfect. Okay. Now I need to erase. And then we're going to be ready to finish this off with pendulums. <coughs> Ooh. Oscillating Shack came up once because that was my favorite one. I love Shack. Oh, wrong notes. Okay, so now this lecture may have led you to believe that a mass on a spring is the only simple harmonic oscillator. And actually, that's not true. <laughs> Everything is a simple harmonic oscillator. Anything sitting at rest, and if you push it a little bit and it goes back to rest, like tipping things over. Anything that doesn't lose its energy to friction is a simple harmonic oscillator. Everything oscillates right around zero. If it oscillates small enough, you can approximate it as simple harmonic motion. So like, oh, well, I unscrewed it, but if I push this and it goes back and forth, simple harmonic oscillator, everything. If I just push it like that, see the back and forth of that? Here we go. Back and forth. It's damped, which we're gonna talk about next time, or maybe this time, but everything's an oscillator. So the second, Physics famous oscillator is the pendulum, uh, which is not a mass on a spring, but a mass on a string. All right, so if we have, you know, something where a string is attached, there's a mass down here. This is the straight down direction where it wants to hang, but if you displace it, by theta and let it go, it's gonna do this. Here is a mass on a spring acting like a mass on a string. That's right. Oh, that's a bad idea. Let me see. Because <laughs> now it's bouncing and going back and forth. All right, so, never mind. You know what would happen. If I were to release that, it would go back and forth. Okay. So it's got properties, it's got M. Let's do a big L. All right. So that's happening, okay? So we want to describe, how does this move? How moves? Or as uh, Planck would say as a child, what's the go of it? That's what he'd say to his devil. What's the go of it? Um, well, it's, it's actually very complicated. It's not as simple as the mass on a spring. But we have to, if we make approximations, it becomes simple. Nothing in the real world is simple, okay? Any real world problem is like not linear and there's no solution and we can't actually solve it until we have to approximate it. So that's everything in the real world. Even springs aren't perfectly linear. Um, this one is linear and, and linear just means it follows those simple equations I showed you. That's what physicists mean when they say linear. And by the way, when we say simple, we mean it's only moving at one frequency at a time. So simple doesn't mean this is easy. That's what simple really means. So we want to figure out how this one moves with simple equations, but uh, it's a very complicated circular motion. There's gravity, there's tension, etc. So here's a few things that are going to help us get there. So first, let's just do our free body diagram here. We know we have mg down. We know we have tension going off at some angle, and it's going to vary. Right? I mean, the tension of this angle isn't even constant. So we have this changing uh, situation. And technically, it's circular motion. I mean, not technically, it is, well, it's not uniform circular motion because it's changing speed, but it is moving in a circle, all right? So I guess what I wanted to say, I'm not following notes here, is that tension is perpendicular to, um, to the motion at all times, 
right? No matter where it is, tension is not along the motion. So what we can do is just use mg sine theta as the restoring force. Okay, I'm not fully justifying this with proofs and lemmas mathematically for you. I'm just asking you to just work with me here for a minute. If you're here, the tension is that way. Is that going to move you along the circle? No. What's moving you along the circle? The component of the gravity down along the circle. Right? It's got a component um, that way and a component that way, counteracting the tension. Right here, we've got a component along the circle and a component like that. So this is the mg sine theta component. And you can imagine now, if we go on the other side, right here, mg sine theta that way. So we have this case that it's mg sine theta that pulls it back, okay? Uh, T is perpendicular, use mg sine theta as a restoring force. And now we're gonna make another approximation for small theta. We have to make some approximations. And the reason is, we could say, wait, well, you say, I don't want to make approximations. I'm going to be the person who figured out what approximations. Okay, then you'd say minus mg sine theta equals m, uh, I guess, like theta or x. If we consider x around that thing, and you'd have to guess the solution to this, right? You'd have to get x and theta kind of the same. It'd be hard, okay? So that's the reason even if you got x and theta in terms of each other, it wouldn't be something where you can just guess the solution. It would be a big ugly mess. So we're gonna <laughs> make some approximations for small theta. Well, we're gonna do a geometrical one here, because you know that if we have the mass here, and this is here, and that's theta, we know that the arc length is theta r. The arc length is that curved length but we're gonna think of this as a 1D problem in X. So we're gonna approximate that that arc length is the same as the distance in X, okay? So we're gonna say that S, the arc length, roughly equals what we're gonna call X axis. This side is negative arc length, negative X. This way is positive arc length, positive X, okay? So then we could say uh, that X equals that theta times L, right? S equals theta R. Uh, x equals theta, and what is r? It's the length of the string. Okay, so that's just telling us x is theta l, that's fine. But uh, our restoring force is in terms of sine theta. Hmm. Well, let's make another approximation. That sine theta is approximately equal to theta. What? Is sine theta really equal to theta? Uh, yes, if you keep your theta in radians. You gotta think in radians. And you gotta remember, remember I said it would be useful to know your sine and cosine intimately. Sine is when it starts at zero. And what is the slope of sine at zero? One. So for really small theta, it's a line like that, that's equal one. It curves later. But right around zero, slope equals one. So it goes one, sine theta equals theta. Right, this is sine theta, and that's theta. So we could rewrite this as a storing force and say the force uh, is, it's negative because it's a restoring force, mg, but instead of sine theta, we're at theta, and instead of theta, we're at x over l. Right? mg minus mg x over l equals md 2 x dt2, sorry about that. That's the same second derivative, it's acceleration. Right? And then maybe you can see what's happening here. It's the same equation we dealt with before. This is physics's, physicist's favorite thing in the world when two different physical systems give you um, the same equation, the same differential equation. Second derivative equal to its own function to then a negative sign and a constant. Exactly like the mass and spring. What that tells you is that they move the same way. Okay, so we're gonna flip the board and see if we can figure out what's the natural frequency of this system. 
before we plugged in, we guessed, blah, 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 and it was the square root of whatever was right here. It's the exact same formula. It's just with a G and an L instead of a K and an M. So the answer is that the pendulum oscillates at a frequency, the square root of G over L, instead of the square root of K over L. So let's write that. So we'll write our pendulum formulas here, which you're going to need. <laughs> These equations won't work for vertical springs. Oh, they will. You just have to know how to deal with the offset. There's just basically a static force, and when you put that in the differential equation, it doesn't do anything. And it's just a long, detailed thing to show you, so we're not going to worry about it. We'll do everything sideways. Um, okay, so for the, so still for the pendulum, our natural frequency that it goes at, it's a square root of g over l. Which is kind of interesting because one, it depends on, obviously gravity is driving it. So the acceleration of gravity determines it. Uh, it's independent of mass, which is kind of interesting. The mass of the spring, a heavier mass oscillates slower. Here it's independent of mass because weight is driving it. So that weight mass cancels the acceleration mass. It's sort of like the idea of projectiles all accelerate at the same acceleration, no matter what their mass is. Pendulums all oscillate with the same angular frequency no matter what their mass is. It just depends on that length. The length does make a difference. And if you want to get a couple of masses and strings, you'll find that this is true. Different masses will go the same, only depends on length. I don't think I have a demo of that for some reason. So if you wanted to write, so this is hugely important one here. I'll triple box this one. They're all going to be on the equation sheet. Okay. So that's very fundamental for the pendulum. And if you wanted to write it as uh, an equation that you're going to play with, X, it's the same. Guess A, we have an amplitude, uh, sine. Um, I'll write it this way here square root of G over LT plus 5. Or you could write it as omega, as long as you know there's a pendulum system, so omega is equal to the square root of G over L. And you can take this and take the derivatives and get the velocity and the acceleration and the force and the energy and the kinetic energy and the mechanical energy and potential energy. Etc. Potential energy in this case is gravitational. So it's a little bit interesting. And you have a problem where you do this is you can say, okay, I have a pendulum here oscillating back and forth, back and forth, and you could treat it in this approximated way and say, okay, I know essentially the spring constant is that. I get a spring constant of that, so I can get the potential energy when it's up here. Or I've been told how fast it's going, and say that all converts to potential energy. And that would give you one number using these approximations. But you can also use geometry to figure out how high is it really, and get the UG from a little MGH right there. So we have one problem where you compare those. Because remember, anything you do here is an approximation for small angles, where you're just barely moving back and forth. So you'll see, it'll make more sense as we actually start it, all right? So, okay, yeah, it's 11.09. So next time we'll talk about damping, the fact that no oscillation lasts forever. Just one little equation for that, basically. And uh, then we'll talk about real materials, solid mechanics, and how materials act like springs. And then we have a review the next week.